the Johns Hopkins dashboard is the most viral map-based application in history. It's a nice pun. Viewed trillions of times. I want to talk about the, the learnings from a pandemic the scale of COVID. It's never been done at that scale before. My guest today is S.T. Girarthy. She's the chief medical officer at ESRI, the big mapping company. In case you're not familiar, Esri is a company that sells mapping software to pretty much anyone who needs maps. Companies, governments, local municipalities. Specifically, we mention the term GIS a lot, which stands for Geographic Information System. Esri is linked to anything related to mapping. And as we'll talk in this conversation, that includes health. Most recently, COVID. How do you vaccinate the world? How do you distribute the vaccines? Mm -hmm. How do you reach every person in the population? You need GIS for that. Esti is in a unique position to work on the intersection of mapping and health. And I'm so lucky in this position to have a clinical background, a research background, and a public health background. This is a conversation about health and climate change and everything in between and why mapping all of that really matters. Before we get started with the interview, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is OpenCage. If you work with addresses and location data, chances are you're going to need a geocoder. Geocoding is the act of translating coordinates, so think latitude and longitude, that are created by smartphones and tracking devices into human understandable places, like street names and place names, or the other way around. So OpenCage provides a geocoding API, which is built on top of open data sources, one of them being OpenStreetMap. This allows them to provide their geocoding API at a pretty low cost, as well as having pretty loose licensing terms compared to proprietary platforms. So you can do things like store the data as long as you want, display it on any map, and use it publicly or behind a firewall. So if it's built on top of open data sources, you may be wondering, like, why wouldn't you be able to do it yourself? Well, you can totally make your own geocoder, but what OpenCage provides is just a simple API that works, and that is reliable, basically they take care of all the maintenance. For example, OpenStreetMap alone gets edited four to five million times a day. On top of that, OpenCage provides information like local time zones, what currency people use, and which phone code is used. Because OpenCage is based around open data, that means their pricing is also pretty affordable. And they have a pretty generous free trial that I encourage you to go take a look, especially if you're just playing around or are doing a personal project. Finally, which is pretty close to my heart, they've been long supporters of the open source community and just geospatial community as a whole. So if this sounds interesting, you can go to the link in the description to see more about them. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. I'm pretty curious, how would you describe yourself? I almost always start with, I'm very organized. I'm cheerful, often just very happy. I like my life. I like what I do. Um, let me rephrase that. I love what I do, actually. Um, so I'm passionate every day. Yeah, I, I try to be methodical, intentional, and combat my own inner laziness. So, <laughs> so let me ask you actually the same question. How do you describe the work that you do? I start by telling people that I'm all about health. I care a lot about people's health and helping health organizations do their jobs better in some way. So I not only focus first on health, but then I think about the geography of health. And people can start to understand it probably if I start with saying, you know, Geography means a lot to how easily you can access care. Do you have a hospital or your primary care provider somewhere near you? How hard is it to get to that person? It's a very geographic kind of question. And I think people understand, you know, oh, well, yeah, it's not that far, but huge traffic jams just to get to my doctor. So it takes me 45 minutes. Um, so we start with, with access. But then I think I talk to them about, well, let's think about all of the other things in our landscape that impact health. What about, maybe you've heard of social determinants of health. These are the different contextual factors in your neighborhood, your community, city, or county that impact how well you're doing. For example, do you live near a toxic waste site? or a major roadway with all sorts of automobile exhaust that may trigger an asthma attack. 
And so then people start to get into the idea of, oh, okay, I can see there's a connection between location and health. And I can always go back to Hippocrates, which is one of my favorites. Um, you know, he is the father of medicine. And in 4000 BC, 400 BC, um, still a long time ago, he talked about the importance of place to health. And where you live determines your health outcomes. So this concept of relating health and place is nothing new. And my job is really about showing those connections in a very real way that's actionable. How does it help you understand something better and then make better decisions or take an action in a very strategic and targeted way? So there's a few things I'm going to want to go over. Like, let's start with the... Uh... The, the historical aspect, like how did you get into why health, for basically? Okay, well, that was actually kind of a decision I made in an evening, believe it or not. Okay, I was in community college. I was uh, I had finished a second associate's degree, and was about to embark on a third associate's degree. Um, I found them pretty easy to do, and and I liked being valedictorian every year. It sort of checked a box for me. And uh, and then my husband, who at that time was my boyfriend, sat me down and said, you know, maybe think about a four-year college <laughs> and, and advancing your your skills. And, uh, you know, I was a little bit resistant to the idea because I was pretty comfortable. But we talked about what are the things that I really enjoy doing. And I really loved computer science. At that time, I thought, oh, I want to be a systems analyst. I want to figure out how to make systems more functional and streamlined and train people to use these things. So that was really high on my list. I was also, at the time, on the uh, forensics team, a public speaking competition team. So I loved giving speeches and just this idea of interpersonal and mass communication. And then the third option that I had in mind was medicine, because I was fascinated by I by biology. I mean, it, really, to be honest, from a personal perspective, because I've always wanted to live to be about 150 or so. And <laughs> so I wanted to understand biology well enough to answer my own right. questions about my health. And, you know, side bonus, I get to help other people be healthier as well. So we talked about these three things. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be a doctor because it's too much responsibility. I don't want to be responsible for people's lives. So I was leaning towards systems analyst. And throughout the discussion, it, at one point, it just occurred to me, you know, who would you want to be responsible for someone's life? Someone who takes that really seriously and finds it kind of frightening and is going to do everything they can to make the right decisions. So I said, okay, well, that's me. So I'll be a doctor. And it combines, you know, I mean, your bedside manner and your use of technology and all of these things really did fit in nicely together with becoming a physician. So so I got the best of all worlds. Right now, you're not a doctor anymore, basically. Like you're not a practitioner. You're always a doctor. <laughs> right. See, that's why I'm asking the question. So can you walk me through how maybe in, in some of the work that you do today at Esri, how, you know, being a practitioner has helped you? I finished my residency, um, all of my training, so that I could go and be a practicing full-fledged doctor. And uh, my program director at the time said, you know, you might want to look at a general medicine fellowship. I had never heard of a general medicine fellowship. I knew about other fellowships like in infectious diseases or pulmonary critical care, but I didn't know about general medicine. So I read up about it, and I thought it was interesting, and I applied for just one program. And this was at UC Davis, and it was called the Primary Care Outcomes Research Program. So the focus was really on how do you become an academic physician? So you have you know some clinical practice, some effort in teaching, and some effort it goes toward research. So I thought, this is a good career for me, because I've already shown you that I like a lot of things, right? Yeah. So, so I applied for that fellowship and I got in. Well, the first year of the fellowship was getting a master's degree in public health because they wanted you to have this broad scope when you're thinking about primary care outcomes research. You're also thinking about population research and, and what impacts people and their health and communities. So, um, so in that master's in public health program, there was literally one lecture in a course called Public Health Informatics 
on GIS. Okay. <laughs> and it was like, bam, <laughs> this is amazing. You know, this is, um, it's visual and I'm a very visual person. I originally wanted to be a radiologist. Okay. And, um, and it's in color, right? Maps. And they're so engaging and I saw it right away. And so, so then I started um, learning more about GIS beyond the um, one lecture. And, and we were given a practicum capstone project for our uh, fellowship. And, and so I decided to do mine on something that involved GIS, which was um, looking at the pesticide exposure from planes, you know, when it's dropped from above instead of ground spraying. Uh, this was done during West Nile virus in 2005 in Sacramento, and people were really up in arms about pesticides being sprayed overhead. And so I wanted to do research that showed whether this public health intervention caused more harm than good, right? So did the exposure give people respiratory irritation or asthma exacerbation cause them to go to a hospital for any reason whatsoever? So I used that as my capstone project, which forced me to learn an awful lot of GIS. By the way, public health pesticides were not dangerous to human populations. <laughs> There's a communication aspect to public health as well, because you can do, you know, all the nitty gritty research of like, turns out it doesn't or it does, but that doesn't mean that people read that and they're like oh okay cool and they move on like there, there's a communication aspect as well to that is that is that part of the work that you were doing i was not specifically on a communications team although i did do uh through our public health pr team some communications particularly at that time i worked for the california department of public health after i was finishing my clinical practice and um i started california's open data portal and so this was a scary idea for a lot of people. What do you mean open data? This is health data. Um, you're not going to expose anything private. And, you know, not only were people, citizens needing to understand, but so were the administration for California because they certainly didn't want a breach of any kind of private information. So I was involved in the communications related to that um, to a minor extent, but um, more more than that, I was sort of a specialist communicator. I did small videos about, you know, what is health informatics? What does it mean to um, comply with uh, information exchange regulations? Um, what does it mean to open data in a safe way? How can people use this information? So it was more along those lines, but um, definitely communication. And I think we've seen this very publicly through the pandemic, super important in public health, and it's difficult to do risk communication. Um, and I'll just add that to make things more complicated, we're also trained in communication on a one-to-one -one level in medicine. Right. Like to the patient, you mean? Right. Okay. And it's similar but different, right? I mean, in a way, it's easier with a patient because you can find what's important to them specifically. There's a feedback with the person. Right. <laughs> and, you know, if you're talking to somebody about quitting smoking and you find out they they for sure want to be alive for their granddaughter's wedding or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that, then you speak to that as part of their goals and how they can achieve what they want. Um, harder with populations because there's always yeah. those who are never going to agree and, and those who... Um, you know, you have to speak at the right level so that everybody can understand the messages. You have to think about multiple languages uh, for delivery of your messages. Let's talk a little bit about the open data and the privacy. I think that's a really big topic. And there's a lot of talk about, yeah, open data is great. And then when it comes to very sensitive data, like a lot of health data, there is this notion of, of privacy. And there's it, it, at least from where I stand, from a lot of the outside related to public health data, it, it feels like there's this tension between the more we know, the better we can work around or fight or whatever, um, prevent uh, a lot of crises, but then the less privacy there might be. What are some of the challenges that you've found? You said you started some of the open data program in, in California. Do you have examples maybe where you saw some of these tensions? You know, there's in California um, and many states and many countries, there's uh, databases related to genetic information, particularly for newborns. And this is extremely sensitive data. 
And uh, But there's a lot of interest in doing research to support improving outcomes for these genetic disorders. And so how do you publish open data that is private enough? Because some of these are rare. And so, you know, if you don't have a, a big enough aggregation of, of observations, then it's more possible to identify somebody. So it was a real struggle. Meaning, sorry to interrupt, you don't need a name to know, oh, you're referring to this person because right. there's only like three cases. Right. Okay. You know, the, hey, I know who that is. The, my yeah. city's got the one case, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so then you'd have to look at a state level, perhaps. So uh, that could make it very challenging to do meaningful work. And I can speak much more directly to the geography of these kinds of questions. Uh, basically, it's always been, we'll just aggregate it up so high that we're 100% sure that the data can't be breached. But then you're looking at information at a state level that you really can't do anything with in terms of localized interventions. Well, in terms of geography, we actually have lots of, of methods of um, blurring data or combining multiple years of data. Or um, one of my favorites is geomasking, where you actually move the points, but uh, in a random distance and direction, but you maintain the spatial patterns still have to have enough observations for that, but it gives you a little more leeway than simply up-aggregating everything. So there are ways to do it, but it's it's tricky, and people are, are nervous, right, because you want to obey the law. You don't want to hurt any individual's privacy, but you really want to be able to use all this rich, important data. You said moving the points. Like let's let's go a little bit more into that. Um, I'm very curious to know how that works. Like I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around. So you're moving things around. You said it still maintains some of the spatial interactions. How how does that work? Do you have maybe like an example of of, of how that could work? I'll try to approach it backwards. Um, so you want to have a situation where you look at a point on a map. And it's been moved enough so that it could be any one of a group of points in your data set, right? So you cannot distinguish that point A is a the person you think it is among points A, B, C, D, and E. A lot of people like to have at least five different neighbors that the point could be. If you work backwards from that, that will help you to determine the distance you're going to have to move points in order to make that happen. We do something called a donut method. So picture a donut, right? It's got a hole, and then it's got an outer edge. You have to move at least further than inside the hole. So you have to move out to that boundary. It's got to be in the donut. So you don't have to go any further than the outer edge. So if you put it within the donut anywhere in that circle, right, random direction, then you are in a safe zone. And when you move that point, it should, if you have a a relatively big enough data set, doesn't have to be huge, then you can maintain spatial patterns because the the five neighbors are still neighbors. They've just all been moved so that you couldn't distinguish them. So how is that different than just aggregating those five into one dot that has the same size as five? It's actually very different because you are keeping point data. And when you have point data, you can have more than one attribute. Okay. If you're aggregating the data, you can only use one. So we've talked about geography and GIS. Is there a difference between the two? And if so, how would you define them? Geography is an ancient science. And uh, my favorite definition of geography is it's about people and places and their interactions. And GIS is software. It's a geographic information system. So any kind of information system has similar capabilities, right? There's a data management component um, and organization, and you can query the data, and uh, you can visualize the data. In our case, with a geographic information system, the data all has a geographic component. And so that visualization is often done through a map. One is the tool. And one is sort of the philosophical, theoretical, scientific yeah, yeah, <laughs> underpinnings yeah, yeah. of right, the tool. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we go a little bit philosophical there, what do you think spoke to you about that way of thinking? There was one map in particular that stood out to me as like telling the whole geographic story. And I still come back to it 
this is almost 20 years later. And that is, it was a map of um, melanoma, skin cancer, in men across the United States. And it was death from, from melanoma. And um, it was just a band across the South and hardly anything in the North. And it was like a very stark geographic pattern, right? Closer to the equator, because this is skin cancer caused by sun. Right. And it made total sense. But the way that that data was put into a spreadsheet was by something called economic units or economic um, polygons. And they had names that meant nothing to me, places I couldn't discern. And so if I'd looked at the spreadsheet, I would have seen no pattern at all. So you decide that's that's what I'm going to do. That's the <laughs> path. Yeah, I did. I um, It was pretty immediate. Yeah. And then I pursued the education and I pushed because it was a little bit different than what all of my academic colleagues were doing. I mean, we were encouraged to do more um, specific science, you know, work on a biologic system or at the basic science level, work on a molecule of some sort or a protein. And I just didn't want to do this. This was a world that opened up like everything because health is cross-cutting. We, you know, I can talk about pesticides and, um, and I can talk about water and climate and air pollution and social determinants of health and neighborhoods and infectious diseases and chronic disease. I get to do it all. So it was very appealing for that reason. <laughs> I think the the biggest example that, of the recent years has got to be COVID. Yeah. Esri was working uh, with John Hopkins to make like probably one of the most famous maps if, I don't know, recent years or decades maybe. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how that project happened as maybe let's let's use that as, as a as a case study basically of some of the work that you might be doing. I'm sure there's others, but this is probably the most well known. I can tell you that the Johns Hopkins dashboard is the most viral map based application in history. That's a nice pun. Yeah, <laughs> viewed trillions of times. So that's like first of all, like just want to pause on that. Like it's mind boggling. It's down now, right? It was oh, yeah. up for three years. Like that's also March the thing. It's was... not. It's not be going on for 20 years. It's We're talking trillions of views over just three years. Well, I'll start with uh, the person who created it was uh, N. Sheng Dong. He goes by Frank. And he was an Esri intern one summer. Okay. And so he was familiar with GIS. And uh, then he decided to do his PhD studies at Johns Hopkins. And, of course, early into his efforts, this uh, infection started to show itself. And his family is from the region in China where this began uh, nearby. So he was concerned about his family. And because he was interested in tracking infectious diseases as part of his PhD program, he talked to his advisor about it. There was, you know, a a coffee meeting and figuring out, well, you know, what, what should we all do? And uh, they decided to build a dashboard. Right. And so he looked for data sources. He found a couple of good data sources that he could use. And uh, at that point, it was contained in China and put out the dashboard. And he built the dashboard because it's a configurable tool and pretty easy to use. He did it in about eight hours overnight. And of course, it's been refined many times. And also, interestingly, it was initially built on a student account. Right. right. So, so how could it get any easier, right? It's, he saw something, he found the data, he put it in a dashboard, and his advisor, uh, Dr. Lauren Gardner, tweeted it. And we noticed um, it started to get a lot of views. Yeah. And that was very quick. And then we started to see other dashboards kind of copycatting what they had done. They looked very similar. I mean, even with the black background and the red dots, uh, very similar indeed, and using similar data resources. Um, but the traffic was getting to be too big for a student account. And so the part where Esri stepped in was we, we contacted Johns Hopkins and said, hey, we see you're getting a lot of traffic on this. Can we help you you know, beef it up the infrastructure, put it in a place where it can 
can manage the traffic. And so uh, we help to support. They, of course, are at the same time building more team members, gathering more data sources as uh, the infection was spreading around the world. So a lot of different things going on at the same time. But, uh, you know, we, not me personally, but my colleagues had regular I think probably weekly or often more frequently meetings with the team at Johns Hopkins to keep this going, to develop new ideas. Um, you will notice if you look at the first tweet to the last iteration of the dashboard, it went through significant changes, um, but incredibly valuable resource. Not only did everybody love, love, uh, <laughs> feel inspired to check the dashboard multiple times a day, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. But um, a lot of people use that data because Johns Hopkins made sure that open data, back to that theme, was foundational for everything they did. People must be able to access the data. So we made it available in uh, in our system, in the Living Atlas, and it was available on GitHub. So whatever people wanted to use, they had an avenue. And and that made the copycatting of more dashboards even more profound. Mm. Literally thousands of dashboards around the world relied on that data. I mean, it's a pretty nice success story for Esri as well. Um, yeah. I mean, we love that that Johns Hopkins was able to create something that was so valuable to yeah. the world. Maybe the cheesy or like the devil's advocates of of the open data is if if the open data is so important why not use open tools as well for for the mapping there's a lot of these out there and you know i'm playing a little bit devil's advocate but there is a lot of open um tooling to do basically a lot of the same things and i just want to use that as an excuse to kind of ask your point of view on that even sure. though you know you work at esri I, i'm so curious to know how you think about it yeah i mean i think there's enough market for everybody yeah. um, to sort of start. I think that's important. Um, and I would say that also our platform uh, bridges with a lot of open tools. I mean, you can use them within ArcGIS, so you can get the best of all worlds. Um, and, you know, I think we all, we value competition because it keeps you sharp, right. um, it keeps you developing the next level. So I think that's important. But there's a caveat. I mean, I obviously I do work for Esri, and I am biased toward um, having supported software. And I think depending on the use of the software, then you have to think about how important it is to have that underlying support mechanism. So there are very few mission critical systems built on open source. So when you mean software, you mean, uh, sorry, support, you mean, for example, when you reached out to John Hopkins to say, hey, do you need help? The technical support and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you need more infrastructure to stand up your your application. That's support. Right, right. And if, it's, if you're using open source, you have to manage that yourself. I want to talk about the the book a little bit and kind of broader the the learnings from um like just a pandemic the scale of covid. What have you seen at them, um, you know, if you think of before covid and then after um in terms of, you know, public health but through the lens of just GIS and mapping in general. Because you wrote a whole book about it, so there's got to be some things. <laughs> oh, there's lots. The pandemic was has been the perfect event to describe the breadth of ways that GIS can be supportive in an emergency, a health emergency. So, you know, if you read through the book, it tries to take this uh, in a stepwise fashion through sort of big categories. Like the first category, uh, I began, of course, with the Johns Hopkins map. It's the cover of my yeah. book. Um, it's situational awareness. And that's it doesn't have to be a pandemic. It could be, you know, what is the situation with uh, climate and health? What is the situation with any particular chronic disease that you're looking at? But you have to have situational awareness. What do you know about the community and its suffering of X, Y, or Z? So that was the first thing. The next thing is uh, identifying vulnerabilities in the population. 
That's another thing that changes depending on what you're talking about. With COVID, right, we were looking at people over 65, um, people with chronic medical conditions, uh, people with obesity, people with essential job functions that put them out in uh, exposure risk areas, people who lived in um, congregate housing. This could be prisons, it could be nursing homes, it could be dormitories. So all different kinds of risk patterns went into figuring out where was the biggest risk for for disease transmission. Then the next part, once you understand vulnerable populations, you need to look at how vulnerable is your infrastructure. So here we're talking like hospitals and their ability to care for every patient that comes in. Right When hospitals are overloaded, you have to start triaging and making decisions that you might not make in blue skies. And so some people who are less sick may have to go home. Uh, you may have to ration ventilators. I mean, all of these things that nobody wants to have to make a decision about. But you can use GIS to calculate when that surge could happen given all of the parameters of the infection and how people are social distancing, what the policies are. And you can make an educated guess, essentially, of when a hospital might be overrun and how long that might last. And then from that point, the next GIS thing that you would do is site selection for increasing capacity, right? Convention centers were used as makeshift hospitals or dormitories to isolate people when, you know, students weren't in schools. There were all sorts of different things that were done, but GIS helps you figure out where, when, how much that's going to be needed given the rest of the population parameters. Then you can start thinking about, okay, what about someday uh, recovery? How do we make decisions about getting people back in the workplace? How do we support contact tracing um, when people are coming back into the workplace? And, and even in the rest of the pandemic, we did things with contact tracing that were sort of a step beyond regular contact tracing. And you probably will want me to define contact tracing. Sure. An epidemiologic procedure where we talk to people with an infection and find out who they've been in contact with. So we can call those people, interview them, see if they have symptoms, and give them guidelines for how to behave and keep themselves well. So you follow that. But in the case of COVID, uh, usually I should say we do contact tracing with smaller outbreaks. With COVID, you have this global scale. And it's never been done at that scale before. One of the things we were thinking was this is a different level of disease transmission. We call it community transmission, which means you might not know who you got the infection from because you're out there at a grocery store. You don't know the clerk or the other people who were in the store. Um, uh, so, so you have this community spread of disease. And we thought that when that happens, location's even more important. Because you want to find out if places like the um, home improvement store where people were going and doing, getting their stuff for projects back at home while they were locked up uh, or locked down, I don't know, maybe those were places where people had to be more careful. So going back to your question about public health risk communication, can we learn more through GIS about the places where infection is spreading, not just the people and how they're in contact with each other. So that's addressed in the book, as well as thinking about future resilience and how do we make our system stronger for the next health emergency that comes up. Are, are there some actionable items? Because I, I think a lot of these, they seem to be like methods of thinking. Like I'm really trying to think in terms of what are the lessons of actionable items that we have to do uh, for the next ones, or even just preventing the next one from happening. Yeah, well... Preventing will be a whole different conversation, and we can go there if you want. But, okay. but the actionable things, I think it's the fact that everything ran more slowly than it needed to. Okay. And not everybody had web GIS. Right. You know, a lot of people use desktop GIS, and, and so they didn't have the training on dashboards or survey tools or doing routing for mobile vaccination clinics and things like that. Um, so it really was a lot of, hey, GIS can help you with this problem, this challenge that you're facing. How do you vaccinate the world? How do you distribute the vaccines? Mm -hmm. How do you reach every person in the population? 
you need GIS for that. So it was a lot of teaching like, hey, you have this tool. Here's a way you can use it to support the current challenge. So I guess what I would say for the future is now that you've learned some of that, don't think of it as situational um, and it just was for COVID. Right. It's for everything. So, you know, we could talk about vaccinations. Well, what other kinds of outreach do you need to do for health challenges in a community? Um, you know, whether you're routing mobile vans to vaccinate or mobile vans to perform health checks for people in, you know, outlying communities. Right. So all of these lessons, and I think to me what I would like to see is one, that people really understand the breadth of what they can do and that it's not just making a map, but it's doing an entire workflow with GIS right. and that we need to keep drilling on it and practicing it. So if you practice it for your other programs, which by the way, it will add value, then you can be so much more ready for the next pandemic. And we saw that. There was some, I'll give you one example, one of my favorites. In the state of Georgia, in the United States, there is a county called Cobb County and they have, um, not in the health department, it's not a health department GIS, but it's the whole county's GIS system. And they reach out to the other departments and help them. Well, of course, they did a lot of work during COVID. And in the first year, they created like 150 new applications to support their community because they were GIS professionals. They knew how to use the software and what to do. And so it was easy for them to think spatially and help solve the problems of the county. A lot of the things that you've talked about here seem like they were, they probably are actions that the government would be taking. And I'm really curious, like, what was the role of a private company like Esri, for example, in in part of that? Like, was it in helping the decision making? Um, because if if you were, you know, working at, um, I actually don't know what the names of the different organizations in the U.S. are, it's but okay. of you know, public health, and you were telling me this, I totally understand. Like, okay, these are things that probably the government has to put in place. But I'm curious, like, what is the role of the private sector? Well, I was very proud to work at Esri during this time. I mean, more so than I always am, because I think we did a lot of good. So some examples of what we took on as, as our role. Um, first, we sent a letter out to a million of our users or, you know, however many were in the database, but I know it was over a million saying, hey, we, you know, everybody's building these dashboards. Here are five steps to COVID response um, that I envisioned. And we put them in the letter and that software was available for this and that we were giving away free software packages to support this disaster response. And we gave away over 5,500 of them. And they also came with the opportunity to get some services. If you needed a little help setting something up or doing a particular application, we did over 26,000 of those. So we're really out there helping. But beyond that, we had all sorts of internal team meetings with top leadership at Esri envisioning what are our customers telling us is, is a challenge that they're facing and how can we help them? We built massive number of solutions and solutions are pre-configured right. software. So um, uh, what's a good example? Well, we have one called the uh, vaccine outreach solution and it, it came with a hub site that was all set up for how do you um, communicate about vaccines? And then it had a vaccine locator. How can you find where vaccines are in your community? And it, um, had different kinds of when when people were phasing when it was their turn to get the vaccine it had a little digital triage tool where you could figure out when it was your turn so we created all of these applications to help governments just like stand it up we'll build it once all of the governments can stand it up they can tweak it put in their logo add to their own language change whatever they want but we felt like in some ways we're able to think spatially we do it every day. So we wanted to like say, hey, take this, use it. If it's helpful, um, we want to be there. <laughs> I'm curious, like, where did these projects come from? Uh, like, what were the initiatives behind those? Honestly, sometimes it's just reading the news and right, knowing right, right, right. things and just spatially. I mean, we okay. just kind of know. Um, 
one example. So the CDC uh, in the U.S. put out a playbook for how to phase and distribute the first set of vaccines. And I read through that playbook on a weekend, and I thought, oh, a lot of this is spatial. I wrote a blog about how you could use GIS to follow the CDC's guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we, people started calling us and saying, can right. you show us how to do this? And so I contacted our solution engineers and said, you need to build some demos and show how this can be done. So, I mean, it, it was this back and forth, but not necessarily always formal. It was sometimes, you know, oh, you hear something, I hear it's that spatial, and then we get to work trying to create something that will help. Yeah, and I think a lot of it probably happened quite quickly. Uh, Very. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there were no days off for the first part of 2020. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can imagine. Yeah, let's talk about a bit about preventing then. You said that was a whole other topic. It seems like you had more where that came from. Yeah, I have this this thing that I say about prevention of any kind. Prevention is very hard to sell. Because it's like a potential thing that you don't really see. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to sell in clinical medicine. You know, if you're my patient and I tell you to go and get a colonoscopy and you're like, yeah, that doesn't sound very much like fun. <laughs> um and you don't want to do it. And I'm like, no, no, it, this can help you live longer and prevent colon cancer. And um, It's just hard to sell. Or if I tell you, hey, you need to eat right and exercise every single day. And we all know that's a lot of work, right? Just trying to do the right thing. And everybody, most people struggle with that. And for what? so that you get nothing in return. <laughs> and that getting nothing doesn't feel very satisfying. Do you mean because if you do the prevention right? You don't like get a health problem. Nothing happens. Right. Yeah. But if you don't, like something bad happens. Right, then you care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. it's just like, it's never, it doesn't light a fire under anybody. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to prevent unless they had a near miss or yeah. they recovered from something and then maybe they see it differently. But I'm just saying overall prevention is difficult to sell. So that makes um, policies really important. So when I worked for the California Department of Public Health uh, and elsewhere, even in my master's in public health education, we always talked about, one, health in all policies, but two, how do you make the healthy choice the easy choice? And we even caught ourselves. So we had this very small co cohort in my public health program about 13 of us in the class. And, you know, we went to school all day long. And at the end of the day, somebody always brought cookies. So we would have a snack in the afternoon. And then we all sort of realized one day, like, well, we're public health people. <laughs> what if we brought oranges? Would everybody still eat them? And so we brought like the little cuties or tangerines and things like that. And and we still ate them because they were there. That that was what was on the table, and that's what people ate. So you can make the healthy choice the easy choice, but that then gets to context and GIS, right? How healthy is your environment? How conducive is it to making the right choices that keep you healthy? You talked a lot about earlier how trying to find which factors put people at risk of COVID, for example. I think you talked about um, obesity, then access to healthcare, and like all these things, like these are factors where we had so much data we were able to figure out, like these people are more at risk than these other people's. That seemed like once we have that, that can turn into prevention, because if we know these things, we can try to help. What have you seen after COVID basically done in, in that direction? Like we mentioned, okay, prevention is hard. Did you see anything still come out of it? COVID related, probably very little, but a few things that I'll mention. Certainly there's still attention in some places to social distancing. Okay. Doctor's offices in particular. Um, some places in the world uh, that I've been traveling still seeing people wearing masks in pharmacies. Really now it's starting to, to tail off, but um, up until just weeks ago, there was that. Um, people being more cognizant on, on airplanes or any place where you've got more people. I still see people wearing masks. So I think many people got the message that if they are in any way immunocompromised or at risk, they could and should protect themselves. And I think some people maybe kind of have that 
lifelong lesson that, hey, beyond COVID, there's still annual influenza or other things that I could get when I'm in these crowded places. Maybe I should take measures to keep myself safe. So, so I'm just really seeing more individuals who are behaving a little bit differently, knowing what they learned from COVID. Um, some institutions, like I said, doctor's offices, pharmacies, um, some kinds of buildings are still showing, you know, hey, keep a safe distance. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but it's more on, on the individual that you're seeing that. I think so. I think the institutions now are starting to move back to their previous state of normal. Right. There's this like really famous talk of Bill Gates, like, I don't know, two, three years before, maybe I don't remember how much it is that everybody brought up during in the middle of COVID. It's like, well, we knew this was coming. Like, how did this happen and all that stuff? And yet we're after and we're like, some of the things I've heard is we actually got lucky. Like, it's, it's not as bad as some of the things we were talking about. Like, do you see, is that conversation a little bit easier now to, to have at maybe a, a policy level? You're talking about like you need to put policies in place. Do, do you feel like, at least from what you've seen on the policy side, it's a little bit easier to have those conversations? I think so. And part of that is because uh, at a governmental level, I know in the United States, but I'm sure elsewhere in the world, there's funding to support modernizing right. our systems and preparing us for the next one. So so with changes or uh, increases in finances, you can now have a little bit more um, uh, influence in policy decisions. So I definitely think that that's a factor, but at the same time, you have a public health and healthcare workforce that's incredibly fatigued, yeah. right? I mean, around the world, people people died that were caregivers um, among the rest of the population that died. And and so you have people who got burned out, you know, because there was no time off. Um, you know, how do you take time off when you're responsible for communities or patients? Um, so very, very difficult for anybody who was delivering care or services. And so you have a diminished and sort of mentally depleted health workforce. So so you've got this funding and you've got potential, you know, policy influence with a workforce that's really fatigued, wants to move ahead. You know, I mean, I, public health people especially are idealistic and want to do great work, mm -hmm. but, but it's challenging. So I think as um, I'm hoping we're going to move into this, you know, sweet spot where all of the, all of the mechanisms, the levers are in the right place yeah. so that we can advance. But we are. I mean, people are using the federal funding um, to start to modernize their systems. GIS is a part of that. And they're putting things in place. I had hoped that it would happen faster. Yeah. Um, I like to move fast. But but it is happening. It's just okay. tough. This is very interesting. It's a, maybe a strange parallel, but I, I had a conversation with... Um, Jeffrey Lewis, who's an open source intelligence researcher, specifically around nuclear disarmament. And that was one of his worries was that in the Cold War era, that was the thing on everybody's mind. So the funding was really high towards preventing nuclear um, escalation. And he was getting worried because he's seeing that funding go down, but the threat doesn't go down. And it seems like public health has a lot of these parallels in terms of the risks are not going to go away. And I'm just curious, the, the reason that like the, the way I'm going here is like, I'm wondering is, is this because it's very recent, like COVID happened just a few years ago. Like, are you worried that the funding might start trickling down again? Because yes. if you do it well, well, why did we do this. Nothing happened. Like it was just a waste of money. No, I, it's, I was wondering where you were going to go with the <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> um, but it's a perfect parallel because I am uh, very worried and, and terrified that public health will go back to being underfunded once everything is calm. And it goes back to the whole prevention thing. When public health is doing a great job, 
nobody sees any problems. And so they don't want to keep putting their money there because there's not, there's no problem, but that's because it's working. <laughs> so it's a, really a very difficult field to keep funded at a proper level because just like with the nuclear threat, there's always health threats and uh, and they will keep coming and they'll be different. And so we'll have to react slightly differently. But from a geographic perspective, you're still going to need situational awareness. You'll still have vulnerable populations. You'll still need new infrastructure and test its capacity and build resilience for the next time learning these lessons. It's all going to be the same from from a GIS perspective. And I think, you know, the other part is a lot of public health is is funded on grant money. And so it's it's term limited. You right. do the thing for the duration of that grant. What we need is sustainable kind of funding. So you need to build systems that can last when a particular source goes away. So, so it has to be valuable, right? It has to um, provide more economies or better outcomes or more accurate data or whatever it is that 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 investment provides. I'm actually curious about the the end of the COVID dashboard. Is that a little bit what happened on that front? It's like, okay, this, like, thankfully COVID doesn't last forever. Uh, I mean, like now it's probably going to be another flu or something like that that's just looming in the background, but it doesn't need this huge attention. Like we, we talk a lot about reacting to a lot of things but it was interesting to see okay it seems like the work is done here we move on were you um i don't know if you were a part of, of that decision but or if you know a little bit how that happened I'm, I'm pretty curious to know i can tell you a little bit about it i don't know if i know the entire story but i was i knew about it uh a month or two before it was going to be shut down. But I also knew even before that, that one of the problems that they were experiencing was one, I mean, we can see how often it's being used and hit. And so obviously it declined, you know, after a while. That's normal. Uh, but the other part was reporting became sporadic. So the stream of input data, basically, right. that you... Because Johns Hopkins was using multiple sources of data in order to populate the dashboard. And some of them wouldn't report daily anymore. And then they stopped reporting weekly. And and so is the dashboard reliable when you don't have reliable data? So I think that was as much as anything, if not a primary reason for saying it's no longer doing what it's intended to do. So we're going to have to shut it down. We've talked about some, uh, like, it's pretty heavy stuff when you think about it. <laughs> yes. And yet, yeah, you're this, you said at the beginning, you're this cheerful, happy, you know, optimistic person. Um, I want to back with some of the philosophical questions. How do you stay positive like that? Like in the face of, a, like, the past few years have probably been pretty rough. And yet you don't seem like it's put you down or anything, quite the opposite. I'm like, do you think about that sometimes? Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's unfair sometimes that I should be so happy. Why? Um, <laughs> I've thought a lot about, you know, how my career transitioned. And I'm so happy that I was in the right place at the right time to be of service during COVID. It really has been one of the honors of my life to be able to support organizations that are helping to save lives. Um, around the world. And and so it was, um, I mean, I put a ton of passion into my work every day. And it was creative and we were building solutions and um, and people used them and we felt like we were really making a difference. So, so I wasn't tired at all. I didn't mind sitting in front of my computer and, and pondering these things and trying to come up with better ways of doing things. Um, so, so being in lockdown for me was not a problem. Um, and I know it was for others, and I'm an introvert by nature. So so that part was okay. And I have a very entertaining husband. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, we had this routine. We would get up really early, like at 4.30 in the morning, and we would go for our daily long walk, get in our exercise when nobody else was out there. And then, um, and then we'd get to work. And I just basically work all day and and then, you know, have little breaks at lunch, go take a, another walk or something. And um, and I literally, for probably two years, never went anywhere. 
like not to a grocery store, not to anything, because I also felt a huge responsibility as the chief medical officer to not get sick. It just seemed like it wouldn't look good. But I've thought about, you know, I mean, I was a clinician and honestly, how grateful I was to not have to be in clinical practice during the pandemic. I can't even imagine how hard it was for everybody. I worked hard, but not like they did. Do you feel like maybe this is back to our earlier conversation? Do you feel like having been a clinical practitioner helped you in that process, maybe through empathy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, your your background, kind of like your context, it, it informs what you know and how you behave. And And I'm so lucky in this position to have a clinical background, a research background, and a public health background. I mean, I, you know, I can speak the languages. I have a sense at least of what everybody's doing and what they're going through. And it helps me to be more rational, rational about what's practical to suggest or what's totally beyond them at this crisis moment and not going to help just an extra thing to do, right? You, you need to make these distinctions because it may be a clever idea, but it could be a just, that's cool, but no, we don't have time for that. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about COVID and, you know, we're, the dashboard's over, like we're on the pretty much trailing end of everything related to COVID. What is your work like these days? What are some of the things that keep you, I'm not going to say up at night, but like busy rather. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the good news is there's always something to do. Um, I would say the key things that I've been focused on lately is using GIS to improve health equity. Okay. And uh, so that's a big topic. So we're really talking about, you know, how do we make sure that everybody can achieve their best health possible? That means they have good access to health care and health promoting services and community assets, and they don't have community conditions that decrease or, or uh, harm their health, like pollution and um, poor infrastructure or things like that. So, so equity is related to what we call social determinants of health, which kind of is a way of um, putting all of those contextual factors into a framework. The other thing that I'm I'm working a lot on is climate change and particularly extreme heat and how that relates to health. Okay. And so, um, especially in urban areas, there's a lot of discussion now about urban heat islands. And so, this is just you know parts of your city, for example, that are hotter than other parts. It could be a particular block or a neighborhood or a whole section. Um, and there's many different reasons why a place might be hotter than others. It could have a lot more impervious surfaces, concrete and asphalt, less shade tree cover, less green grass, um, more um, what they call waste heat, like heat coming from buildings and, and energy producing processes. That heat has to come out somewhere. So there's a lot of ways that you can create like microclimates of excess heat in already hot days. So how do we, one, mitigate those factors and improve community resilience and people's ability to be out and about and have a life even when it's hot? The first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, this is where satellite imagery comes in. Uh, <laughs> do you work a lot with satellite images? Like what are some of the, like a lot of the data we've talked about is um, either people go in the field and like report it. I'm really curious if you use yeah remote sensing satellite images. We do, but not as much as other industries that use GIS. But I think climate and environmental health are exactly where those um, satellite images and other kinds of imaging technologies come into play. It's just not been as much used in health to date. So I'm seeing more of it with the climate discussions. Um, but, uh, you know, health has been focused on, you know, demographic data by census poly polygons and, you know, health by, so it's all dots and polygons and not as much imagery. But this is exactly the place where imagery is going to start coming in. So I think our field of health needs to start learning how to deal with it. Do you see any um, 
roadblocks or like things that are making that harder like basically the question is like okay if this is useful why isn't it used more do you see roadblocks to me the perhaps the biggest roadblock is that in health many times GIS is perceived as a tool that you use when you need a map it's not until more recently as integrated into all of your processes and so given that working with imagery and geostatistical data i think is far more complex and requires more gis or more yeah gis expertise and so so you have a little bit of a skill gap right. i think and and attention gap right is gis going to become a central tool that is part of all your programs and everybody or a large number of people know how to use it or is it an epidemiologist in the department who can make everybody's maps when they need a map right. so we got to get to that point of baseline level of gis expertise then we can move on to higher levels of expertise and and my perception is that remote sensing and working with imagery is a higher level that sounds a little frustrating to hear because i wish it was easier <laughs> i do too but it's but this is why i'm curious to ask that question because i think the 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 ways in which a lot of this data becomes useful is cross disciplinary it's when people who think through the lens of public health can see oh this data allows me to ask new questions but if we can't put it in the hands of these people it starts, yeah. it starts well the need drives the use yeah. right i mean it's very much like modernizing public health systems covid showed us a need and then there's funding and now that, that can happen in the same way you know on the tail of covid the increased emphasis on climate is coming up and this whole idea of one health which we haven't talked about but one health is the intersection of human health animal health and environmental health and there are several diseases that we consider one health diseases and in fact coronavirus is one of them or mosquito borne diseases um and so for that environmental component of understanding one health is also an area where um remote sensed earth observation data could be very useful i've heard you talk about this concept of one health can you define to me it's a a microcosm of what geography and gis do so if i go back to geography the definition is people and places and their interactions well this is similar uh, the whole idea is between uh, or of one health is that these three areas of those who know and understand animal health those that know and understand human health and those that know and under understand environmental health come together and work together to solve common challenges which is to prevent the transmission of disease rather than separate uh fields right okay. because you know i mean i'm a huge fan of system science because we live in a very complex and interconnected world and so if everybody's trying to do their work in a silo almost like i was initially taught in the beginnings of my research you know you should focus on this one mm. molecule or this protein and know everything about it but that doesn't work anymore you need to know how that protein reacts within a system that has particular conditions that make it go one way or another and do different things and uh, so one health really is that microcosm of a systems approach that will help us solve really big challenges so it's complicated and i think we really haven't done it before because technology might not have been ready before i feel like this is a conversation around climate change as well and the the thing that popped into mind is we were talking about how hard prevention can be um and we, you know we were taking the example of colon cancer or diseases or things like that i feel like when you do eventually get cancer or there is an uh something like covid these are big changes that happen like at one point um for cancer it's not it's like but you you learn about it at one point um covid happened you know it didn't happen one day to the other but it happened very quickly it's like um a big stress that happens 
And climate change is a lot broader. It's a lot slower. It feels like the prevention is even harder to do. And it, like saying, okay, we're going to have to pay attention to this. Based on what you just told me, it seems like it's going to be even harder to get people on board. And I mean, this is a conversation people have heard about and we're starting to talk about it, but it seems like getting people on board to start using new tools is going to be even harder for specifically climate change. There goes federal funding and requirements to use resources in particular ways to uh, improve communities most at risk. So, uh, so I think there are policies in place to kind of help guide the effort, but you're absolutely right. I mean, climate change is a great example of the difficulty of prevention. Some people might say, climate change isn't a problem for me. I, my home's air conditioned. Yeah. Right, you know, and, and in their world, it's not, according to their perception, making a big difference for them. So they don't feel that fire to get involved or to do anything differently. And, uh, and not only that, but I think there's also kind of cultural differences from one country to another where um, people feel either a need to do what's right for me and protect myself, or I'm only doing as well as my the person next to me, right? My my brother, my sister, um, we all have to be doing well for, for me to say we're doing well. So this is very different cultural outlooks, and I think it makes a difference in how people treat the planet, what actions they take, how much in the forefront of their mind climate change is, um, but something that has long-term impact like this where it may not be even their generation, but a later generation that's impacted, very difficult, even harder than colon cancer screening. <laughs> we, we talked about like traveling and you know seeing different parts of the world um, even before we started recording this. One of the things I've seen and I've witnessed uh, in a few countries is that climate change is kind of a luxury to worry about for a lot of people in the sense that you have to have a certain amount of base needs already taken care of before you can start thinking about what's going to happen. I think it's a little bit the same thing for cancer. If you can't make it to the end of the month, this thing that's going to happen in 10 years, it's like a problem for later. And there's a lot of parts in the world where there are a lot um, more problems closer in time. So shelter, safety, food security, a lot of these things. And they're, they're all very interconnected because if the climate starts going haywire, food security is not going to get any better. But if you can't feed yourself next month, it doesn't really matter. And then um, biodiversity goes down, a lot of diseases can start happening. And But the incentives for people are very different and they're not better or, or worse. It's just that people have different problems. I'm, I'm really curious if this is something that you've witnessed, seen as well, and maybe how you think about it. Yeah, no, I think you said that very well. Um, I, I think about it from experiences at the individual patient level. So when I would teach residents how to care for a patient, say in our outpatient clinic, we might have a patient come in with totally out of control diabetes, Right? And this is critical because this could lead to so many down the road problems for them. You know, they could end up on dialysis or with a leg amputation or blind. Uh, big problems, right? But they also have back pain. And they don't want to talk about their diabetes until you fix their back pain. And but the resident will say, "Well, but the diabetes is a more important problem." But it's, but you would have to teach them that until you address their concern. Yeah. They're not even going to listen to you about the diabetes. So you have no hope whatsoever. And so in a way, to me, what you said kind of goes back to the idea of, of equity and the importance of health equity. Because until you can get people at a baseline level where everybody has a potential to reach their best health, then you can't really get people to think about other health impacts down the road. They're too busy trying to solve today's problems. Mm -hmm. So yes, I've seen that happen many times. <laughs> I, I want to pivot uh, the conversation, and one of the things that I was really curious to ask you about is the fact that you work remotely, uh, and it's been, uh, I think, a year, you told me. Almost. Um, 
And I, I was quite surprised at first. Someone, you know, on the executive team at a pretty large company like Esri working remotely. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how, uh, more about that. Well, first of all, I feel very fortunate yeah. to have the opportunity to do this. And, you know, I think a lot of things went into my ability to take uh, this kind of a role. Uh, one was um, I had decided about five years ago that I really wanted to have kind of a nomadic lifestyle. And so I just started on my own personal road of making that happen um, trying to, you know, build up a savings and get rid of accumulated stuff in the household and all that kind of stuff. Um, but on the work front, it, it required one really big decision um, by me and one big decision by Jack. Um, <laughs> so the big decision by me was to give up my role in business development, um, where I supervised and managed a, a team. And to move over to an individual contributor role where I mostly do what we've been talking about, the public speaking and the writing and, um, you know, I think it maybe minimizes what I do a little bit by saying evangelism, but strategic messaging about how GIS can be useful in health. So that transition was sort of difficult. You know, you go from this yeah. kind of big leadership role to... It, Nobody reports to me anymore, but it gave me freedom because now I don't have to be in a time zone with my employees. Then with the pandemic, we had a lot more flexibility when it came to remote working. And so I've been able to leverage that. Um, the big decision Jack made was to let me do this. <laughs> and, uh, and I try to take advantage of it. So when I'm in different places, you know, I'll contact our Esri distributor in that place. Right and see if I can help support their work. If they don't know a lot about health and GIS, I'll teach them. Or if they perhaps have uh, a customer who would like to meet with the chief medical officer at Esri, I can go out and meet with them or do a public lecture, I mean, all sorts of things. And now it gives me this opportunity. And when I go to a place, I start researching their healthcare system and, and what's going on so that I can speak reasonably about it. So I learn a lot, which contributes to my expertise in my job. And then I also get to outreach, which hopefully empowers our distributors and others. I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into that decision, uh, if, you, if you're comfortable talking about it. Mostly because you don't hear, like, you know, people's career trajectory. Like, you go, you you climb the ladder, and then you you, you step down. That's not usually what you hear people uh, talk about. So if you're, yeah, if, if you're comfortable, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, what led to that decision. I'll start with um, my husband's European. And before we met, he had done quite a lot of world travel. And I always thought that was fascinating. And I hadn't really done much traveling at all until we met. And uh, it's been 31 years now, but, um, but I, I really loved it. And so in 2018, um, or the end of 2017, he got sick and with a potentially life-threatening illness. And he's fine now. So yay, medicine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that really changes the way you think. I mean, you, I am such a better doctor now that I understand what patients and their families go through with a life-threatening illness. And uh, and you think about what's important, what you want to do and achieve, how you want to spend every day. And so he and I got to thinking, my husband and I, and one of the things we realized is we'd kind of like to try living somewhere else. So we read all of these books by expats about what's it like to live in Costa Rica? What's it like to live in Panama or, you know, any place that are common expat locations? And frankly, they all sounded pretty good. And so we kind of said to ourselves, well, why do we have to decide? <laughs> Let's do them all. And, uh, and so the plan started to begin. And so, so you have to really change your mindset if you're going to do something like this. Because at the time, we had two homes and two cars and lots and lots of stuff. And uh, we had to pare it all down, sell things, give things away. And now I've got a 10 by 10 storage with my most treasured items waiting for me someday. 
and uh, I live out of a carry-on size suitcase. Um, but I'm trading things for experiences that we want to have. And so, so it took almost five years to do all of the finances, to digitize all of my paperwork, make sure all of my bills are on automatic payment. You know, I mean, there's a lot to it. And, uh, and then we took off. So, so that was sort of how it happened. And since uh, last July when we started, I think we've been to around 19 countries. And it's fascinating. Yeah, what's what's a year of working professionally still and then having this nomadic lifestyle? So you go, to explain a little bit, you move from country to country, you stay a few days and then move on to the next. Yeah, we're actually trying to find the sweet spot in terms of number of days. I think it's between seven to 10 days for us. Um, there's enough time to get to know a place a little bit and, uh, you know, and then move on because I'm still trying to knock off all the countries in the world as a, <laughs> as a bucket list item. What I do is I like to work three hours in the morning. Um, well, let's just say, you know, today we're in Belgium. Um, and, and so on Central European time, it's my favorite time zone, by the way, <laughs> uh, because I can work three hours in the morning and it's quiet time. I'm super productive. No phone calls, no emails. I mean, just get work done. And then I do three hours in the later afternoon where... I overlap with U.S. time, which is where most of my connections are. So I can be on business calls and have conversations and interactions um, at that time. So it splits my day very nicely. And then I have from, you know, mid-morning to late afternoon to play. And that's what we do. So I finally, after zillions of years, <laughs> found a little work-life balance, quite a lot of adventure, and still feel good about being very productive at work. How long do you plan on doing that? Well, my first answer is as long as Jack will let me. Um, <laughs> Jack, if you're listening. <laughs> I think as long as I feel like I'm contributing and being productive, um, because I think I've said this a few times, I love my job. I really want to keep helping people use geography to improve health. Um, so, so as long as that's still working and I feel like I'm doing good work, then I'll keep doing it. But I no longer have to work for financial reasons. So um, so this is perfectly by choice. Yeah. Is it being tricky to, like, it seems like it's a big lifestyle change to say, okay, there's set office hours. This is where I live. This is where I work. Maybe you would work from home a little bit, especially during COVID. But having this um, regular life, basically, to every week is somewhere different. You live in a suitcase and still you're working. How has that been? It's mostly good. The hardest part is when you go somewhere and there's not a good workplace. Um, so now, you know, I mean, I use a lot of Airbnb and uh, booking.com and I always look for a dedicated workspace. And you can see pictures, so I can see, can I work there? Uh, but I've been in some non-ergonomic places in the beginning when I was still learning the ropes. And I had uh, two days where I had to do all of my work sitting on a bed. And it was so <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> it sounds nice at first, but no, it's not comfortable. <laughs> yeah, and you were telling me you have to find good Wi-Fi everywhere. You need, like... yes. I always check to make sure that they say they have free and good Wi-Fi. A lot of them now are reporting on their sites the Wi-Fi speed, yeah. which is great. Especially, you know, every once in a while I'm scheduled for a webinar and I need to make sure I'm in a good place for that. Um, you know, lighting is important. So, you know, you, you have to think about the work things. So it's not just choosing places that are fun and in the center of activity. It's choosing places where I can work. It's kind of like a location in a way. It's yeah. like finding where you can stay and all the attributes that you need to find. Um, yeah. I think different things would be uh, important to different people, but I've kind of got my list and, and we're starting to get it down. I don't have so many fails as I did before. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm sure like there's a year that's that's quite a bit of experience. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this is a nice place to, to start wrapping it up. Uh, just like how I, I like asking the same question when I start, I have the same question when I end these conversations. I like to ask for uh, a book and a podcast recommendation, mostly because I've, well, there's two reasons. The first one is I feel like it's a different way to learn a little bit more about a person. Um, what they might be reading or listening to. And then a lot of books and podcasts just um, go through word of mouth. There isn't necessarily as much recommendation algorithmically. Um, 
So, well, leaving this book aside, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which of course I recommend people reading, um, but just it doesn't have to be about anything uh, we talked about, just something that you think uh, you may have read, or read recently or listened to um, that you found was valuable to, for people maybe to know about. Gosh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> really, and I, I read books for entertainment, usually mysteries, um, so I won't recommend that. But I think one that kind of translates a lot of the things that we talked about um, and I loved reading was um, The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner. And so what he describes is uh, he was a National Geographic fellow, and he found places in the world where people more often than average populations live to be over 100 years old, right. so centenarians. And there are seven places on the planet that have characteristics that apparently lead to longer lives. And I told you, I got to be 150 at least. <laughs> so, so I was very interested in this book and some of the advice and and what are the commonalities that are found in these different communities? So I really love, um, I love that book for interesting to hear about people's lifestyles in these different places and also practical because what of that do I want to apply to my own lifestyle? Right. Um, so that's a good one. And podcasts, um, I'm going to recommend the um Public Health Podcast by April Moreno, and uh, she's doing a really nice job of pulling together really interesting public health information and speaking in you know a really um, friendly, casual manner, kind of like we do, about the important topics facing public health. And she's also a friend of GIS, so I appreciate that about her. Um, although not every podcast is about GIS, but April Moreno's public health podcast. Because we're towards the end here, I want to go on a bit of a tangent. Uh, what does it take to go to 150? Oh, um, well, I think optimism and <laughs> cheerfulness are Fair important. Enough. <laughs> um, really, I mean, I don't think we have any real understanding of how important um, curating our mind and, and our thoughts uh, is to longevity. But I think it's probably going to become very important. So first, you have to believe you can do it, and you have to want to do it. I have people tell me all the time, you don't want to be 150, you're, you're going to be decrepit. <laughs> right. And I'm not. Um, so I think it, it also requires... Uh, obviously, eating right, keeping in good physical condition. I'm a huge believer in moderation. And uh, some people say moderation in all things, including moderation. So, you know, sometimes you splurge, but, but you get back to a baseline of normal. Um, but, but honestly, I think it's mostly about the barriers to belief. I don't believe that people who are in their 90s can jog every day. Or, you know, I mean, it's those those little things like at some point you stop um, exercising because you're too old or at some point you stop doing a particular exercise because you're too old or I've earned comfort food at this point in my life. Being those, those are beliefs. Right? Beliefs that are okay. barriers to longevity. So, uh, so I think a lot of it's in your head. Right. And I'll work on the physical part, like what we know from science, but I definitely think the mental part is important. What's your level of confidence that you can make it to 150 today? Absolute. Really? Absolute. Yes. I think science is going to make it possible, and I think I'm still young enough to benefit from that science. All right. Well, we're going to have a if you still are around, and I am too, I think that would be a heck of a conversation. <laughs> yes, have. let's have a reunion. <laughs> <laughs> Esti, thank you so much uh, for your time. This was a really fun conversation. Thank you. I'm glad you had me.